Thank you guys, it's Alex Canelo here with a quick game of Ghostbusters! I was about to head out the door, and I saw the credits calling. I hear those credits calling. Right around the bend, I'm Elvis Canelo. I do a uh, 3 million super jackpot, and I go over here to start the scene with the uh, Spook Library. Here's a pump strike technique. I'm just going to lob it just barely up over there, so it'll slide back here, and then hopefully I'll get it up there. If I don't like it, I can actually let it fall through. In fact, I'll see if I can demonstrate that. Well, a little too soft. Got another try. Retro Future Active. A radio show for puppets by puppets. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peacefully to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. According to Quantum Psychiana, this is a religious document. Cult of the Month, where you belong. A lo-fi production. Coming to you after live, from the Chapel Perilous deep inside the Messiah Complex, the offensive resents Retro Future Active, sponsored by Cult of the Month, a division of Shutterbooks Corporation, Specific Benefit Corporation. Retro Future Active is performed by puppets for puppets. Retro Future Active reminds listeners that handling live belief systems with its bare hands can be deadly. Remember to always use puppets, otherwise there is a dangerous chance that someone will take you seriously. Our nervous systems are the simulators in which the universe exists. Every day is an initiation. Proudly sponsored by Arthur Miller Dance Studios. The Quantum Psychiana app is now available on most platforms. <laughs> JohnBlack.com. Frank Bruce Robinson was born on July 5, 1886 in the small village of Buckinghamshire, England. He was the eldest of four boys. His mother was Hannah Rosella Coop, his father, the Reverend John Henry Robinson. The Reverend was not a kind man. Frank could not figure out why his father had it out for him. Nothing he ever did was right in his father's eyes. He was beat for the smallest of infractions, and as Frank grew, his resentment mounted over the hypocrisy between his father's location and his drinking, carousing, and meanness. Frank had a special affinity with his mother. He felt that he had received his spirituality from her. Frank claimed that at the age of three he said to his mother that he saw the world was a shallow thing. This world is not the real world. There is another one. His mother encouraged him and with her he felt secure. In 1888 the family moved to Long Crendon and went to Halifax where Frank's mother died in 1894 when she was 33 and Frank was eight. Her encouragement gave Frank his only security, and when she died, Frank's only anchor was gone. After his father remarried Ellen Hay in Huddersfield, the situation got worse, for his new stepmother was cruel too. Frank said he could be led and reasoned with, but he would not be driven, and so he rebelled most of his life. Finally, Frank came home one day and found his stepmother beating his younger brother Arthur and became so angry that he started beating her. His father forced him to join the Navy, he was 13 or 14 at the time, but soon concocted a medical discharge by jumping overboard and faking illness. He went home briefly, but was soon sent with his brother Sidney to Canada. Their father had given them a letter of introduction to a minister he barely knew, so with two hours and fifty cents each, their brothers finally got to Montreal where the minister, for whom the letter of introduction was for, turned them away. Another example to Frank of the clash between his ideals of the church and the reality. From there, Frank worked in many places, getting jobs, driving teams, and doing anything to survive. Once he had some stability, Frank started his search for God. At a Baptist Bible school, his enrollment was paid for by Dr. Elmore Harris, the millionaire owner of Massey Harris Farm Instruments. Dr. Harris had heard Frank preach and wanted that fire for his Baptists. Frank did brilliantly for a while, but again, he was driven to move on because of more of that hypocrisy. Because of a frustration at not finding God, he started drinking and the never-ending tale of getting drunk and ending up somewhere, getting a job and then getting drunk and losing it. Frank lived this tale in Regina, Moose Jaw, Vancouver, Victoria, British Columbia, Portland, Seattle, Ellensburg, Spokane, and San Francisco. 
He tried the Royal Northwest Mounted Police, joined the Salvation Army, and the Navy again. Logged, worked with dead horses, was a pharmacist. Well, like all other endeavors since Bible school, he was let go or drummed out as a chronic alcoholic. Finally, in San Francisco, while drunk, he ended up in the Army at Angel Island. Shipped to Manila, where, as Frank explained it, he refused to have all his teeth pulled and was court-martialed for willful disobedience. After getting drummed out and ending up on Market Street, Frank says he gave up drinking. He had reached bottom. He discovered, the way to find God is to believe you have found him. Next, he went to Klamath Falls, Oregon, where he worked as a pharmacist. With a bit more stability and resolve, Frank met and married Pearl. Pearl kindly supported Robbie throughout their time together. They moved to Tucson, Arizona, where their son Alfred was born, and later a daughter, Florence. The family moved to Portland, where Frank reported a vision where he saw the house he could live in and the trials and tribulations he'd have to go through in, in the future. Though daunting, he finally knew what he had to do. Part of Frank's newfound purpose was to find a job at a pharmacy that closed at 5 p.m. so he could have the time to write and start his new religion philosophy. He found one at the corner drugstore in Moscow, Idaho in 1928 and moved the family there. Though he knew his purpose and what he was meant to do, it wasn't until 1929 in North Hollywood, California on Laurel Avenue that Frank had his first contact with the God he was looking for. This happened when Frank finally decided to cut loose from all religious forms, and he realized that the fear of hellfire had hindered him from reaching his goal. He finally said, Oh God, if I have to go to hell, I'll go with the consciousness that went there earnestly trying to find you, God. And immediately the guilt he expected to feel, he felt at peace. He realized that immortality is possible here and now. Now all he had to do was go home and tell the world about it. So he started his own new order religion. Frank had a special affinity for Moscow. He mentioned it many times in his writing. He loved the area, even though he had a hard time with many of the people. One mistake that hindsight points to the fact is that he didn't want local people to receive lessons or learn anything worthwhile about what he was doing. Consequently, what people didn't know, they made up. And the stories about Psycheana still survive today. Frank was open, though, and even with their own religion in their own house. Her own children were still members of the Presbyterian Church. Frank was called a spectacular and aggressive man. With all that energy, he owned three drugstores, a newspaper, and other real estate, traveled all over the country giving talks and radio shows, writing newsletters, lessons, and 23 books. He spent a lot of time helping people, responding to their cables, and sometimes driving to see them. Frank suffered a serious heart attack in 1940, but he continued his frantic pace. He died October 19, 1948, of a lung hemorrhage. When asked what would happen to Psycheon after his death, Frank replied that he had sown the seed and that it would never die, but continue to grow. Son Alfred and Pearl did keep the apparition going until 1952, when they said the escalating postage and printing costs made the operation prohibitive. Frank was a man of contradictions, where he considered himself just a man who was a vessel or a teacher, at the same time, he would call himself the Archbishop of Psychiana and come off sounding rather self-important. And Frank's all-embracing God would still come across at times when God was on his side. He was a teacher and a salesman. Contradiction was evident talking about his two different realms at the same time, the one of his experience, which was idealistic until everyone had experienced it, and the other living in the physical world and dealing with the real world. In Frank's mind, lawmakers, such as Congress, were arguing over ways to deal with the fact that no one can be trusted. What difference does it make? To attempt to legislate human actions, to attempt to make a selfish man or nation good, clean, pure, and selfish moral by legislation or agreement is to attempt the impossible. The change will come from within if it comes at all. Frank worked hard the last 20 years of his life to spread his ideas. He was chosen, he thought, to help the world find his true God. Considering the times, he had more perspective than most in presenting a unified view of God which he hoped would embrace everyone enough to stop the fighting and violence in the name of religion. Now, I first came across Psyche and Frank Robinson uh, well after I had the idea uh, for Cult of the Month. And uh, I heard uh, about Psyche Anna, the mail order religion headed by Frank Robinson, the, uh, the mail order prophet with the money back guarantee. I remember a few years ago, I went on an epic motorcycle uh, journey uh, from uh, Minneapolis down to San Diego Comic Con. And on the way, I met my uh, father and grandparents for the first time. So in the last, uh, last number of years, I've been developing a relationship as I've managed to de-orphan myself. 
and finding out more about my father's side of the family. And that's when I found out that uh, Frank Robinson is actually my uh, great grand uncle. He married my father's mother's aunt. I had a more idea going into this that starting religions was a family business. I originally investigated uh, Psyche and I, expecting a family of chicanery and such, and as I read more and more of the guy's stuff, I actually had no argument with it. The great deal of it is basically chaos magic theory, the name that I'm most familiar with. Um, but basically, chaos magic theory, uh, in the language for people who were brought up in early 20th century American Christianity, it's uh, another interesting synchronicity about this is that uh, Frank Robinson died on October 19, 1948, and my uh, daughter, Gemma, was actually born October 19, uh, 2014. Uh, just an interesting coincidence. And had uh, my daughter been born a son for completely unrelated reasons, and um, he would have been named uh, Franklin. So. Uh, just an interesting synchronicity. Uh, coming up, this is a, a, a transcribing of the first lesson. Uh, I'm going to read these out to you. I'll get better at them as I do them. And the first one's the longest. So, oh, interesting thing about uh, Frank Robinson is a, um, uh, for my uh, family, what I discovered was that he had a, uh, he had a nice car that he would like to drive around town. He did, he did well for himself. He ended up getting into a uh, newspaper battle with the local with the local newspaper because basically he showed up in town and wanted these uh, uh, materials printed for him, Sakiana. Now he felt that he was being charged an unfair price uh, by the uh, local newspaper because they, the guy in charge they, he did not like him and uh, didn't like Frank and didn't try to hide it. And he also, you know, found Frank to be a threat to him, and he threatened him to, uh, that he'd use his political connections to, to crush him if he tried to start a newspaper to rival rev his own. And Frank was like, I'm not here to start a newspaper. And I guess basically he pissed off uh, Frank enough to make Frank go, all right, then we'll start a newspaper. So there were two newspapers in this town that couldn't support two newspapers. But it was, uh, Frank Robinson was not a, uh, a man to be uh, backed down or to uh, quiver in the face of uh, adversity. Uh, he called things like they were. And while well, I'm proud to take that seed that he has planted and help it grow into uh, quantum psychiana. Quantum part of psychiana comes from Melanie Anton Wilson's quantum psychology. We uh, will have a lesson from both Melanie Anton Wilson along with some uh, Alan Watts and some William S. Burroughs. And thank you for joining us here on Retro Future Active, home of Cult of the Month, a uh, project of Shutterbooks Corporation, a specific benefit corporation. A uh, benefit corporation is a new type of business entity you can form here that allows a corporation to exist for a reason other than profit. You, know, you have non-profits, which are, exist for a higher purpose, but not allowed to make any money. That's why they're called a non-profit. And you have a for-profit companies, which exist for the reason of just that, for-profit. Should they stray from doing anything that is not for the sake of the almighty dollar, a uh, shareholder can have a tizzy fit and sue them and get quite wealthy, which is one of the reasons that corporations appear to be psychotic in nature is because they have one purpose, and that pur purpose is uh, profit. Now, a benefit corporation allows you to have a corporation that exists for a reason other than just profit. You can still make money, unlike a non-profit, and you don't get all the tax breaks as, as a non-profit, but in today's uh, tax structure, a non-profit and a corporation are... So that, that said, I, I found, on March 23rd of uh, 2015, I founded Shutterbooks Corporation Specific Benefit Corporation. And the specific benefit is one word, and that's illumination. So now we're rolling out our first service, uh, Cult of the Month. It's a monthly subscription service where we enroll uh, our members of Cult of the Month into a new religion. Uh, on October 23rd of 2015, Cult of the Month enrolled all its members into the religion Quantum Psychiana, the thing you're enjoying the education of now. Now, the thing about uh, Cult of the Month is that Cult of the Month believes in a concept called original membership, or um, original membership, much like uh, Catholicism, which, which has uh, original sin, the idea that everybody is born tainted. Cult of the Month believes that every sentient observant being or SOB in the universe, both real and imagined, is a member of Cult of the Month. Therefore, when the first Cult of the Month started on October 23, 2015 with Psyche and Cult of the Month enrolled all its members into 
quantum psyche in her. That made quantum psyche in her not only the largest religion in the world, but the largest religion in the multiverse. So we got that going for us, which is nice. Welcome to the club. Congratulations, you're all members. Uh, some of you who have been so kind as to uh, pay in and financially support at these crazy endeavors, I would like to congratulate you and uh, on your uh, status as protagonist. Congratulations, it's all about you. Another aspect about uh, having a uh, corporation is that Shredderbrook's Corporation being a corporate person because corporations are people, according to many. Now, uh, uh, Shredderbrook's Corporation, as a corporate person, holds deeply held religious beliefs. And those deeply held religious beliefs are whatever the cult of the month happens to be at that time. So it'll give us a nice pivot point for satire in the future. Um, keep in mind that while we are uh, having everybody join a new cult uh, every month, the cults themselves can last longer than a month, and hopefully will. We'll see which ones uh, live, which ones die. I was asked if I was going to be the next L. Ron Hubbard, which I, I can see why the comparisons are, uh, are made, but I think the guy's a hack. I mean, he started what, one religion? We're going to blow past him by Thanksgiving. And I also find it interesting that Frank Robinson himself did not teach psychiatry to the people in his immediate area. He didn't want to deal with the idea of either a congregation or uh, forming around him. In fact, the uh, nearest he allowed to be taught was uh, up in Spokane because he didn't teach it to the local people. And they kind of made it up on their own about what he was doing. In fact, there was like warnings against students going to the University of Idaho, the large university in Moscow, Idaho, because it would be under the influence of Frank Robinson. He was railed against in the church because, you know, he denied the divinity, uh, the idea that uh, God is an external relationship and the idea that you need somebody to come between you and God. That was uh, horribly rejected. He believed that, the, that inside each of us is the God power and that you can communicate with it and bring prosperity, health, and goodness into your life through this realization. Now, uh, psychology was was originally uh, it was an ad in a, a psychology magazine. Uh, Frank Robinson tended to advertise in kind of thinking people's magazines, like popular science, psychology magazines, and such. And he considered uh, psychiana to be a psychology and a religion. It's uh, psychiana, a name that came to him in a dream. Psychiana took off, and uh, there was an early supporter who mailed him forty thousand uh, dollars to help spread the word of psychiana. So if any of you happen to have a random $40,000, if, and if you would like a uh, interesting repeat of uh, history, please find our donate button. <laughs> uh, greatly appreciated. Now, another thing I've been asked about uh, Cult of the Month is all on the rabbit tax dodge. And uh, while it could be, it is in fact not. I show books and uh, Cult of the Month in their deep religious beliefs believe that it is a religious responsibility for religions to pay taxes, especially if that money is not being used to help the needy. If it is being used to help the needy, then it should be deducted and not taxed. So we have that consistency. Also, taxes are the price we pay for civilization. I like driving on roads. I like having maintained national parks. I enjoy the fact that uh, somebody processes my fecal waste and handles that. I, I, I'm glad that it's handled on a large scale. And taxes are the things that pay for that. I've also had to re evaluate my view of the IRS because so it, for so long they were the easy target. You know, you know if you wanted to you know, endear yourself to the crowd, all you had to do is start grouching about the IRS. But without them, we have no other fu we have no other functioning government. So. Well, you can say that it sucks to pay taxes. I consider it a, uh, a honor and a responsibility. Even uh, George Carlin, who got hit in the ass by a, by a huge tax charge, it took many years, many, many, many years to uh, fix it. But even he was like, don't mess with the IRS. It, 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 pay, t pay your taxes. One of the things about forming a benefit corporation is that you're required to have the same transparency as a nonprofit, and we plan to use that transparency to the utmost degree. When uh, we get to the financial wherewithal to start hiring our lobbyists, we will 
have them trained, and they will be comedy writers, but uh, they will be wearing officer body cameras, or lobbyist body cameras, whenever they do their lobbying, because for the public safety and for absolute transparency. We will, sh we will show you how the sausage is made. What we're doing over at, uh, with the Cult of the Month app is uh, I have an idea for a uh, future technology called Shutterbooks. It's not a out-of-reach technology, uh, it's all existent today, we just got to figure out how to put it together. And what we're going to do is start off with a very simple app for Cult of the Month, and it'll just be a little bit of sound. Uh, I think we've added a scrying mirror to it as well, uh, more to it. Um, but what we'll do is we'll add uh, one feature a uh, month and kind of use it as a way of exploring interactive storytelling until we eventually get to the Shutterbooks level of technology, which I believe will uh, be a resource that will make all literature approachable and understandable in a non-judgmental manner. Uh, I also want to help uh, use creator's time better uh, when it comes to the creation of uh, Shutterbooks by just using modern design techniques. We can do it better. We, our computers are fantastic at doing boring, repetitive work, so we'll let's make them do that. I also want to make a uh, platform that is uh, supportive of creators itself, where creators get 55% uh, of the actual of the sale from uh, every sale of their work, which compared to traditional print is uh, gargantuan. Uh, a lot of companies through the digital digitization of uh, information have been able to cut out the middlemen, such as, you know, the, uh, they don't have to physically manufacture the good, they don't have to physically store the good, they don't have to physically ship the good, this, they don't have to have a secondary storefront to sell the good, and what they've done is they've uh, taken all that savings and gave it to them. I say the uh, creators uh, should get, the, get more than half of uh, everything that is from their creation. It's a uh, better environment for creators. Uh, the other 45% will go to you know, defray the cost of making it, and also going to sh support Shutterbooks itself, uh, an, an agent of chaotic good, a, a corporation that is also in our project. Even though you need to uh, corporate, uh, so we won't put any forms of uh, copy protection on Shutterbooks. Let's face it: uh, if you're putting a copy protection on something, the only uh, people that's really inconveniencing are usually the legitimate users of it. Um, people will pirate things. For some, uh, for some people, it's a matter of just choice. They have other things that they would rather spend their money on. But when people start to appreciate Shutterbooks, I think they'll understand that. That they're taking money away from the creators. It's not like the record industry where, you know, if you rip off an album, you're maybe taking a cent or two <laughs> from the uh, actual performing artists. You know, what you'll be doing is you're taking a, you know, a good chunk. And perhaps at a future point when you have the financial wherewithal to uh, compensate those creators that gave you that joy, that insight, that moment of being that made you so happy or brought you right. Um, you can always go back and uh, purchase them. There will be other kind of animations to help help transfer from the physical to the digital. I, uh, I'm moving for all myself as I sit here in the Chapel Perilous, deep in the deep in the heart of the Messiah complex. I am surrounded by books. I am surrounded by dead trees with their uh, little ink smudges on them, very well choreographed ink smudges. My back hurts. Uh, we're going digital, and it's a lot of. Uh, Digital is a, is a better place to be. Uh, you can update it. It's cheaper than the manufacturer storage distribution. It's an infinite resource. You know, not, 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 not a scarcity. The only scarcity would be a, uh, a first false scarcity. It's dynamic. One of the issues I have with modern digital comics is I love comics. I write comics. I'm currently writing a Robert and Tom Wilson for Beginners, a graphic novel coming out for the line of four Beginners books with uh, Sal the Dark Cloak my good compatriot and partner in many, many, many of these crimes. My problem with uh, most comics is what they are is that they're print comics that are scanned and then they call it digital comic. And then it's a scanned comic is what it is. When you're designing for the comic environment and you're doing it for the digital environment, you're not static. You're not just working with dead, flat wood. But what I think is important is that you don't make it animation. And they did an interesting experiment on Marvel Comics and a couple other people in DC and a few others did these uh, motion comics and they took some very well done comics including some by uh, Warren Ellis 
and they took the panels apart and they removed the words and they brought in voice actors to perform it and uh, they kind of animated the comics. And they, they, they uh, used different degrees of production values, but even the better ones with the better scripts, they, they were boring. I found myself physically falling asleep during them. And it, it, it seemed like kind of a, um, a media failure. It, it was not an enjoyable experience. And what I realized was that with comics, it's a, it's a, it takes place inside the reader's mind. It is reader-driven. The story can't advance until the reader advances the story. And one of the ways that the reader advances the story in comic books uh, is through the reader's control of how time passes. You know, you can, as a writer and you know, as an artist, you can uh, do little tricks to kind of, you know, uh, control the pacing of it. But it takes place inside the mind of the uh, reader, much like a novel. It's just a novel with visual help. With the motion comics, it was a passive experience. The story would advance with it, whether the reader was with them or not. The, the viewer, it went from a reader to a viewer aspect. And passive, and it's just not interesting. It's, it it uh, just came across as crappy animation. Uh, you know, with a traditional uh, comic, the reader is advancing the story, the reader is controlling the time for it, and it, it will not advance without the reader's help. While a uh, film or TV or more interactive media is passive, uh, it will continue on when the uh, viewer is paying attention or even in the room. When you're making digital comics, keep that in mind. Make it an active experience, um, and that's how you'll keep people interested. If it goes to a passive experience, kind of a um, story of morals, which can have its points, but I don't think it should be the, uh, the mainstay. It's, it's easy to lose somebody in, in, in that feature. The nice thing about a uh, shorter book is that the reader physically advances the, uh, the story, and how that happens can you know, vary with the story. And, you know, the nature of the story, so you can't go on until you actually find it all, though. When doing the uh, Shutter, Bo Shutter Book, let's say, let's say we were going to release a Shutter Book of uh, Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. We were designing Shutter Books initially for the tablet environment. We would select the Shutter Books app, the library would be there, they would select Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. And every book or story it would have what I call its, its animus, its, its, um, its animating spirit, its, uh, its guide, if you will. And for something for uh, Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, it would probably go with something with more like a scholarly, uh, professorial uncle. To, you know, it would be the, the voice of the book itself, and it would be the, the voice that reads you the book. You could basically program basic language features using both the sound design and game design techniques to create kind of a very limited uh, AI uh, that is uh, your host to this living book. The uh, book would open up, the text would be larger than usual, and a font appropriate you know, to both reading and retention, but also to the nature of the story. Images could be mixed in as, as appropriate. Uh, but here's where it should have really shine. Let's say you get to the line, and then the raven perched upon the bust of palace above my chamber door. Now, 99% of people are going to go, who the heck is palace? And they get the idea that it's a person because it's capitalized, but it's not a common word for reference. What you can do in a shutter book is at any time touch the word palace, and the narrator, no matter who they are in the story, can go, oh, 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 yes, palace. And then it operates, it goes into a little subroutine. Where in the same mood and atmosphere that we've been building up story-wise, the image changes and we see a statue of the, of the uh, Greek goddess Athena. And the voice would go, Paris is a, name, is a part of the name for the Greek goddess Athena, goddess of wisdom, goddess of... And then give the full explanation of who Paris was. And then, uh, when they're ready, they switch back to the book and it started the line where they had the question. And then the raven perched upon the bust of Paris above my chamber door. So that way, people are not only hearing the words, uh, they're understanding it, and they're getting the information when they request it in a uh, way that is supportive of the atmosphere and story that we've been experiencing so far. And they say, is that like an ebook where you can get you know, f you know, 15 definitions for a word, and one of them might apply. Uh, but chances are, the reason it was included was because of the metaphor. But here, what you can do with a shutter book is you can actually include it to that specific usage and uh, offer them a more approachable version of almost any work because you can offer them uh, information 
upon request in a non-judgmental way. And if you can imagine that applied to Shakespeare, I think that's huge. Um, there's a huge problem with the way that we teach a lot of Shakespeare. It's by necessity to a certain extent. Uh, not everybody has access to world-class theaters, but the idea of a classroom full of people who are already awkward in the bodies, reading the words that they don't have a tongue for, to people who don't have an ear for the language. And it's confusing, it's frustrating, it's embarrassing, and a lot of people just think Shakespeare is stupid at that point, and in that way it is. But if you were to uh, be able to do a uh, show books approach to it, you can uh, have plays and tablets. You can have people kind of go at their own pace, or you can have, uh, you can uh, sync tablets together and uh, have the play take place individually for everyone simultaneously. It's, a, uh, it's an interesting dynamic. Uh, also, when it comes to information, uh, teachers could uh, access to see if the kids actually got through the book. And since it's, uh, it's not a passive experience, they can't just leave the book on play. They have to advance through the story, and uh, hopefully it would be more interesting for them to go through the story than to try to just flip quickly through, which we'll be able to tell them that, that they just flipped quickly through. I also foresee an ability to uh, assemble a curriculum outside of textbooks. Uh, the Texas School Board recently showed once again uh, they should not be allowed to be involved in the education of uh, children. They uh, referred to uh, the burden of African slaves and the utilization of slave labor. Uh, they didn't call it slaves, uh, they called them workers. I had an opportunity to meet the uh, Texas school mom who made a viral video about uh, McGraw Hills publishing uh, of, in reference to slaves as workers. We uh, were at the taping of the nightly show in New York City, and it was, uh, it was good to be able to talk with her and thank her in person. Uh, McGraw Hill admitted a mistake and they replaced the word uh, workers with forced migration, still avoiding the word slavery. Texas are fearful because in, 19, uh, in 2040 they believe that uh, white people will become a minority and they're full of fear because maybe they think that minorities are not treated well in this country. They have 25 years to fix that. Playing underneath our show today, we had a fair amount of Perfect Oranges album Spill, as well as some organ covers of some pop favorites. Uh, Quantum Psychiana will have its uh, first lesson of classic Psychiana on the next recording. And now a few words from friend of the show and key co-conspirator Kevin Kling. This story is called Star. My earliest memory places me on my father's knee. He's pointing up to the stars and he says, you see that star Kevin? I reach up my tiny hand. Gah! My dad laughs. He goes, you want to touch it? Gah! He says, no, Kevin. Let's leave that star there. See, with that star there, you can go anywhere in the world. That star can take you to places never seen by another. But more importantly, that star can bring you home again. Gah! Now, had my infant tongue been more explicit, I could have explained to him, no, father, the universe isn't a machine, it's a creator. I mean, that's why our lives are stories, not syllogisms. And I don't want to use that star as a vector. No, I want to go there. Because if I can get to that star, it's a short hop to the next, to the next, to the next. And in no time, I'm hunting with Orion. I'm cartwheeling with Cassiopeia. I'm trafficking with the gods, drinking their wine, eating their meat. No, father, get me that star, and I'm never coming home. Yeah. Ah. Uh, cold of the month, it's where you belong. We are in this together, get in the law. Cold of the month.com. Come join us, it's where you belong. We're about co conspiracy. 23, use the fish and leaf. The 23rd of every month, you'll be in a new cult. So come stop by the website and enroll. Cult of the month. Dot com. We're in this together, get in the law. 
Cold of the month is where you belong. Come join us today, Cold of the month.com. Yeah. This is uh, pincombo.com. Find out more about what we do and how you can help us and uh, uh, help uh, create Elvis Canaveral's Pinball Dojo and help nudge the future at pincombo.com. Zazu Zaz, I appreciate it.